All right, here we go. We have NBA champion Eddie Curry. Welcome to Vlad TV. Thank you, Vlad. Thanks for having me, bro. I feel Absolutely, like I should call man. you Vlad, man. I, I, I see. I, <laughs> I love that crunchy black interview so much. I'm like, when I see him, I'm gonna call him Vlad, but I'm, I ain't gonna do that. Nah, <laughs> go for it. Call me Vlad. <laughs> no, call me Vlad. It's, it's all, all good, good, bro. No, it's thanks for having good. me, though, man. I appreciate it. Of course, man. Well, you have a, a very, very interesting story. And since our first time here, I want to start at the very beginning. So you were born in Harvey, Illinois? Yeah, Harvey, Illinois. Um, Ingalls Hospital. Yes, sir. So like kind of the south side of Chicago, but it's one of, it's one of the south suburbs. Okay. And you grew up in uh, Calumet City? Yeah, that's where I, that's where I went to uh, high school. But I grew up all over the south side, really. Okay. And I mean... What was that like growing up during that time? It was crazy because, you know, we bounced around a lot. Um, and that was right around the time where they were, like, tearing down the projects and things like that. So, I mean, what started off is, like, I used to have, you know, white neighbors and stuff like that. And it started to get, you know, it started to change once all the people from the city started moving in. Um, and everybody started moving out. Um, so you just you just really noticed the just the whole dynamic of the neighborhoods change, you know, and um, just had to had to adjust to it. Okay, and this is roughly about like an hour outside of Chicago? Oh, hell no. It's probably like 15 minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes. Oh, okay. Like right there. Like people in Chicago, like they'll, they'll say like the, like my boy Quinn Richardson, like he gives me shit because like he always like, man, you not from Chicago, you from the suburbs. I'm like, bro, ain't, he know that he know it ain't the suburbs though. But like, but like, I mean, like probably, like I said, 10 minutes, not even 10 minutes, bro. Okay. And I mean, what were the 90s like? in that area during that time? It was crazy. I mean, you had, you know, all of the gang stuff. It wasn't it wasn't like it is now, I don't think. It didn't feel like it. Um, Cause you knew how to kind of, you know, dance around it. You know, you knew how to not affiliate yourself with it, or at least to the point where it wouldn't get you, you know, killed or hurt or in, in, in trouble or something like that. And for the most part, everybody kind of had codes. You know, if you were an athlete, they were gonna let you pass. And, you know, they knew you would try and do something with yourself. So, I mean, for the most part, it was fun for me. Well, you yourself, did you ever get caught up in any of the street stuff or were you just an athlete and just completely left it alone? No, nah, I was just an athlete. Um, I mean, you you can't help but to have friends that that's in it because it's like you either an athlete or you just in that type of lifestyle. So, I mean, I, I definitely was, was privy to it. I knew everything that was going on. But, you know, I came from a two-parent household, you know, and my dad was real strict. I had to wear my hat straight forward or I couldn't wear one at all. Like, he's one of, the, he's one of those type of dads. Right, you're actually named after your dad. He's Eddie Curry Sr. Absolutely, yes, sir. <laughs> okay, so in the beginning, you weren't even into basketball. You wanted to be a gymnast. Damn, you crazy with it, yeah. Absolutely. You know, we had this uh, group called the Jesse White Tumblers. He used to be like the Secretary of State, Jesse White. And he had this group of tumblers he would take around and they would do like the little, the Bud Billiken Parade, which is a big parade in Chicago. So as a kid growing up, I didn't think the NBA was an option or anything like that. And I didn't like basketball. I was always tall. And I was always kind of the outcast because I was so tall and awkward. So I really just did what all, all the other kids were doing. I was trying to do tumbling and stuff like that. Like my favorite athlete was, other than Michael Jordan, was like Dominique Dawes because I loved the floor exercise routine and I would always watch, you know, gymnastics and stuff like that. So yeah, that's what I wanted to do. In my mind, my idea of making it would have been, you know, joining the Jesse White Tumblers for real. Uh, okay, but. You don't usually see seven foot tall gymnasts. Yeah. So, I mean, you yourself, when did that growth spurt really start to hit you? I, uh, I would say the growth spurt probably hit me around, mm, I was always taller than everybody. As long as I can remember, honestly, man, like I would say fifth grade, that's when it started. I started realizing I was just as tall as the teachers. And then mm -hmm. like sixth, seventh grade, I was like six, 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 five, six, six. By eighth grade, I was probably six, eight. Yeah, for sure. Six, eight. Because wow. I remember the first article out they did about me was like a 6'9", 8th grader already facing big decisions because I was trying to figure out what high school I was going to go to. And, I, and that was like the first time I was ever like in a newspaper. Okay. And you actually joined the basketball team in 7th grade. Right. Okay. And you were how tall by the 7th grade? 7th grade, probably 6'7". Sheesh. Yeah, So you man. were just towering over everybody. Over everybody. Yep. Uh, okay. And... How quickly did you really become kind of like one of the top players in the city and the state and so forth? I mean, it happened kind of fast, honestly, because I would say seventh grade is when I really started hooping a little bit. Um, I kind of got discovered um, 
one of my good friends, one of my family friends, he passed away. His uh, name Donnie Kirksey. Um, he's one of the first people that really kind of took interest in me. Um, I think from there he kind of got the he 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 kind of took me to William Wesley. I don't know if you know who World Wide West is, but he he actually now you know uh, works with the Knicks and things like that. But like that's like Uncle West. Like he really kind of like between those two, those are the guys that kind of really. Put me in that put me in that place to where I can get better. Um, just kind of like in high school, I was okay. Um, but once I saw once I saw I had that kind of attention, and then just like we had a lot of you know in our neighborhood we had we had a group of friends that always loved hooping, so we just kind of pushed each other, and I just kind of you know just got good honestly. But right, and there's a documentary uh, that was done called Preps uh, Chicago Hoops right. about you and a few other kids that were basically in the process of either going to college or going to pro, but, and so forth, right? Right. Yeah, that was dope, man. And honestly, like, it was one of those things where I was a kid, I was in high school. I was kind of annoyed by the whole thing. I felt like, man, I don't even feel like doing, like I really was really, I did the minimal when it came to like filming that show. And that's when I look, when I look back at it, I'm like, damn, I wish I would've taken it a lot more serious, just, just given where everything is right now. But it was really dope. And it was funny because when I got to the league, that's one of the first things everyone would say to me. Like when I first met Shaq, it was like, man, I used to watch your show. I watched your, uh, I watched you, uh, what do you say? I watched you fixing your sounds in your car one day. And like, it was it was crazy to me. Like, damn, I can't believe all these people were watching it. But yeah, man, I, they, I got the opportunity to do that in high school. That was, it was really cool though. Right. And in high school, uh, you came in second place in the IHSA state playoffs. Yeah. Uh, you got named Illinois Mr. Basketball. Um, you know, and your stats were kind of, you know, off the charts. And then in 2001, you made it to the McDonald's All-American team. Right. Which, from what I understand, if you make the McDonald's team, it pretty much assures you'll get an N NBA slot at some point. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty much guaranteed at that point, um, especially because I ended up getting MVP of the game. So mm. I think after that, it was like no chance I was going to go to college. <laughs> right. Because, I mean, originally... Didn't you ha sign a letter uh, of intent to play for DePaul University? Yeah, I, I signed to uh, go to DePaul, but even at that time, I knew I wasn't going to go to DePaul. That was more just a, trying to lure athletes to come there because I really wanted to try to support my city, man, any, in any way I could. Um, I mentioned Quinn Richardson earlier. That's, that was really like a that's really like a big brother to me. So I always, at, at one point, I actually did want to go to DePaul, but once I knew I wasn't going to go, um, it just really. I just really wanted to put some light on that program. Okay. And, you know, I mean, there's a, a number of notable athletes over the years that went, you know, from high school straight into the pros, you know, Kobe probably being the most famous one. Uh, but what really made you, you know, make the decision to say, okay, I'm not going to go to college. I'm going to go straight to the NBA draft. Um, I, I really just didn't know what would happen if I got hurt. I was scared to get hurt. I'm like, man, if I go to college, man, and get hurt, I don't know. I don't know what will happen. Um, of course, I, I wasn't too thrilled about doing classwork. I wasn't too thrilled about, you know, early morning workouts and all that type of stuff either. And I, I mean, as a basketball player, man, at some point you just look at the league as like, man, you want to get there. So when I had an opportunity to do that, um, I was like, man, there's no way I could pass this up. Once I knew for sure, you know, my by my, senior, my, my junior and senior year, I was seeing like, B.J. Armstrong and all of the other like NBA coaches and scouts, they were coming to my games. So I, I knew then, like, man, it's it's not gonna happen. Me going to college is not gonna happen. And I mean, at some point, you know, you had like uh, North Carolina and Duke, and everyone would call and they would be interested, but they were like, man, if you're not gonna come, we're not gonna waste our time because we could really, you know, be recruiting somebody else. So I understood that, and that really just made me kind of solidify the fact that I was not gonna go to college. So then the NBA draft uh, in 2001 comes around. You get picked fourth overall, which is very, very high considering you're still fresh out of high school. Right. Yeah, you man, know, You're going crazy. against all these college dudes that have been, you know, <laughs> coming out of Duke and all these, you know, tier one schools. And here yeah. you are fresh out of high school, number four in the draft. Yeah. I mean, it was three of us, too. I mean, you got to think, like, the number one pick was a high school kid, Kwame Brown. Number two Ooh. was Tyson Chandler out of high school. Number three was... Pal Gasol, and then number four was me. So it was crazy, man. And honestly, I wanted to go number two because, like, like, like I said, man, I wanted to, I wanted to go play with the with the Clippers, man. I was, I was a huge fan of Q. 
and I was a huge fan of D Miles and just the young. The, I feel like they really embraced those those young those young guys there, man. I'm like, I, I want to go play with them. So when I knew at the draft I wasn't gonna get get picked by the Clippers, my agent was like, man, you can go to um, you can go to Memphis at three or you can go to Chicago at four. And I was like, I just go home. Um, so that's pretty much how I ended up going to Chicago, and Powell went to uh, to the Grizzlies. I mean, how did it feel, you know, to join the Chicago Bulls, considering you grew up in that area? And, you know, Jordan was just, you know, considered the Messiah. And, yeah. you know, the Bulls had just such an unbelievable run with, you know, six championships and so forth. Like, how did that feel? It was crazy. But, you know, at the same time, man, when you're that young, man, all you're really thinking about is, like, you just want to hoop, man. Honestly, like, I, I, I definitely understood the gravity of the situation. But at the same time, I was like, I'm ready to make a name for myself here. You know, I was excited that I was able to go home and, I mean, go from New York to going back home to, like, my family coming to the games and my friends and everything. But I just wanted to hoop, man. I wanted to try to, you know, make a name for myself as, as, as fast as I could. That was really all I was thinking about. Okay, and how big was that rookie contract? What was it? Uh, maybe 14, 15 million, something, something like that. It was a okay. lot. No, nothing like they're getting right now, but it was a lot for them, for sure. Okay, so here you are growing up in this family that's having to move around and so forth. Right. And suddenly, and you're what, 18 at the time? 17, 18, yep. 17, 18 years old, $14 million. Yeah. You know, granted there's taxes and your agent gets some and everything, but there's still millions and millions left over after that. Yeah. That was crazy. I mean, I can't even really put it into words, but it it wasn't like that was why I was doing it. You know, but at, at that point, man, you so like caught up in trying to be the best. Um, I was fresh off of like my feud with Tyson and all the other high school players trying to be number one. Um, I was fresh off of the draft and just trying to get acclimated to that. Like I really wasn't thinking about the money because um, as a kid, all you really wanted some some dope shoes and some dope clothes and stuff. And I had all of that already. I was already getting stuff from Nike and everything like before that. So I was like, to me, I had already made it. Um, it wasn't like they sent the money directly to me and I saw just all that money sitting in my account. I had a, you know, an accountant and stuff like that. I immediately was on a budget. So it was like, it really kind of didn't hit me like that. I didn't even get a house right away. I got my mom a house, but I didn't even have a house right away. I ended up, get, I got a uh, Escalade and that was about it. Okay, so here you are, you're on the Bulls, and uh, Ron Artest is on the team. Right. Uh, Jalen Rose is on the team. Charles Oakley is on the team. Yes, sir. Uh, all three guys that uh, I interviewed at some point. Uh, so, but the rookie year for you wasn't really that big. You didn't really get a lot of time to play and so forth. Nah, man. Uh, I was playing behind Brad Miller and who's my guy. But, I mean, at the same time, I, I felt like, man, they really, uh, they really brought us along slow. Um, it was, it's totally different from how it is now. I think, I think, I think teams really play their young guys right away. Uh, for us, they really was not. They weren't trying to play us like that for whatever reason. I felt like we were ready. I felt like we showed them enough in practice, but they just weren't trying to. They were just trying to bring us along really slowly. Right, and at that time, Jordan was playing for Washington. Yeah. So I mean, how much of a, you know. The ghost of Michael Jordan, how much of that was really floating around the Bulls at that time? Oh, man, it was there. It was still there. I mean, you got to think, like, even the fans that we had at the game were there because they had already bought, like, season tickets to see Jordan play with the Wizards. To You know, like, it was, like, all our fans were there to see MJ. All our fans were there because they had already bought seats and had became season ticket holders for, from a couple years ago, a few years ago, so... Um, and it, it, they didn't make us feel bad about it. Um, it definitely didn't hurt, didn't help that we were losing like we were, but I mean, at the same time, they really supported us a lot. I mean, every single home game was sold out. It was, it was packed. It was, you just felt the love from, from the city for real. We just wished that I, I wish personally I could have did, you know, more, especially in those early years. I mean, did you get a, a chance to actually play Jordan at some point? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We played them. I mean, I played a little bit. I just didn't play a lot. At that time, I wasn't playing a lot. And then they would kind of alternate me and Tyson's minutes. Sometimes he would play more. Sometimes I would play more. Like, not until, I would say, a, a few years in did they start playing us both, that we start, like, you know, starting and, you know, really, really making the team ours. Okay. So then 
the second season comes around. Mm -hmm. And that's when you really get in your stride. Right. You actually led the NBA in field goal percentages. Yep, I took down Shaq. Shaq was uh, Shaq was like always the guy that that, that pretty much always had the, the the field goal percentage, and I actually uh, won it that year. That was crazy. Right, fifty eight point five. Yep. Uh, and actually, that's the first time that the Bulls actually got a major, you know, statistical category since Michael Jordan in in nineteen ninety eight. Yeah, man, that was crazy. I didn't know. I mean, I didn't. I knew because they told me, but I wasn't. I wasn't shooting for it. I wasn't aiming for it. It wasn't. It just kind of happened, you know. I sh I had a lot of dunks. That's all I could say. A lot of dunks. A lot of layups. Okay, and by this time, you know, you're two years in now. Um, are you starting to spend money, splurge, you know, go crazy a little bit? Mm, two years in, no, not really, not really. At the, at that time, like I said, I was still on a budget. I still had um. I still had my um, original um, uh, accountant that I came into the league with. So I was pretty much still on the budget. Uh, I think I did have a house at that point, but it might have been a, I think I had a townhouse at that point, actually. I was renting a townhouse. I don't think I bought a house until maybe my third year in, I think I bought a house. Well, I mean, a lot of times when you start making money like that, you know, everyone starts to gravitate towards you. You get a lot of people that, that try to siphon off your success. And was it around that time that one of your friends put himself on your life insurance? Man, that was, damn, Vlad, you did your homework. Okay, that was, let me think when that was, bro. That was, uh, that was when I was playing for New York. That okay, that came New later York. on. Yeah, that happened later on. Okay, but he actually put yourself himself on your life insurance? Absolutely. My, uh... My agent or accountant at the time, I had to update my life insurance. And I was, um, you know, this is before like faxes and stuff like that. So I had to, for some reason I had to, I had to mail it to him. So I gave it to my guy, my assistant to uh, mail it out, man. And, <laughs> and then I got a call. Yeah, I got a call a few days later and my accountant is like, did you mean to put him on your, and I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, he, he changed the percentages and gave himself a percentage of your life insurance. I said, that's crazy, bro. That's, of course I didn't. So I had to I had to let him go, man. So if you died, he'd get a big check, basically. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, okay. So, I mean, in 2002, you have this stellar year uh, for the Bulls. But then the cardiac problem started around this time? The cardiac thing happened in uh what was it 05, 04 maybe I think it was 04. It was the year it was the year before I went to the Knicks, um and it was li literally just one episode. Um uh, I can remember I was playing um we were playing the Bobcats, and before the game we shooting around and stuff and I just kind of felt this little weird rhythm like my heart it was just like an extra beat it was beating normal but it would just be like an extra beat every now and then, and I remember sitting down I sat down um at half court with Tyson, because we always would sit there and just talk about the game or whatever. And I'm like, man, I don't, like, like I'm like, I, I feel like an extra beat in my heart right now. And he's like, man, stop playing, because he, like, a lot of times, a lot of guys, like, in those type of cities back then, like, they kind of really didn't want to play in those type of games. Like, the Bobcats weren't, like, one of those cities you would really get up for. So he's like, man, stop playing, bro. Like, we got to play this game. I'm like, man, it ain't about playing the game, Tyson. I don't miss, I don't duck games, bro. I I really feel a, a weird beat, bro. And he was like, well, go tell Fred, man. Fred was our athletic trainer. So I go in the back. I'm like, Fred, man, I got this this extra beat going on. I don't know what it is. So he puts the, the stethoscope on me, and he was like, yeah, I definitely hear it. So he went and got the other team physician, and then they got their, like, uh, the main doctor for their team, and they were like, you know what, there's definitely something. Um, let's admit them just to be sure. So they admitted me there in Charlotte just to observe me and everything. Um, I never was like short of breath. I never had any, I, I was never faint, nothing. I, I felt completely normal. I just had this extra beat. Um, and then uh, and then that goes into the next day, that night the team flew home. They're like, you know, we don't really want to put you on an airplane just in case something is wrong. Let's keep you here for observation and we'll just, we'll fly you out once, once we know everything is cool. Um, so the next day, they I think I think it was the next day they kind of they kind of came to the conclusion that it was all right for me to fly. So they flew me home private, um, and I went straight to I think Rush Hospital, one of the hospitals in Chicago that was affiliated with the team. 
to just keep getting, uh, keep trying to figure out what was going on. So um, they had me scheduled to do, uh, to go inside my artery, like in my uh, growing and fish uh, a line up to my heart because they said they, they, they said they really don't know what it's from, but they were going to do a procedure where they fished a little electrode up to my heart and kind of zap that one spot out because they said for whatever reason, that one area in your heart is producing some type of electrical charge and it's making your heart do that. So they was like, we could fix it with that and everything would be cool. But when they were prepping me for the procedure, it just went away. It just literally went away. So they couldn't do the procedure because they didn't know exactly where it was coming from anymore because they needed to they needed it to actually have the episode to 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 fix it. So they were like, well, we just got to send you home. So they sent me home. Um, I'm like, well, can I play? They're like, well, we we don't know for sure. They sent me to some other like big time heart doctors all over the country. They start sending me to like they sent me to Boston. They sent me to uh, L.A. They sent me to uh, Minnesota. All of these big time doctors. One particular doctor had someone who uh, who he sent back to to play, and he died. And and I think because of that, he was really like, I don't really want to clear him because I don't know what it is, and I can't really rule out that it's not HCM, which is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, something like that which is like a enlarged heart or something like that. Cause they like, you know, your heart, your heart is large because you're a big guy and you're an athlete, but it could also be large because it's stuck like that, which would be a sign of HCM. Um, so it ended up being a thing where like, he was the only doctor that was like that. The other doctor was like, nah, he's fine. He's perfectly normal. Um, the bulls were like, well, let's do a deconditioning test. And so this is like, like I said, this is mid season. So they're like, well, decondition. I'm like, what's a deconditioning test? They're like, well, you need to sit still for whatever, three to six weeks or something like that. It was a long time I had to just sit still and basically let my heart go back down to normal size without like exercise. I couldn't exercise, couldn't do anything. I had to just literally be a couch potato because they, they measured my heart, measured the chambers and stuff. And then I had to go back in weeks later and they would measure it again. And if it went back down to size, then they would clear me to play. So that whole time I had to wear a heart monitor, I had to get out, I had to do all this type of stuff, get MRIs, contrast MRIs, I had to get shot up with dye, you know, I had to do all type of stuff. They never found anything. Um, my heart went back to normal size, but the Bulls were still not willing to let me play, basically. Um, and it came down to a situation where they were like, we want you to take a DNA test. Um, because you know we don't know if 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 maybe you could have heart disease and or maybe you will eventually develop heart disease. We don't know, so we think we feel like with a DNA test we can at least rule that out. And if we can rule that out, then we'll let you play. And this was like the year before I could get a big deal, and I had been playing well. My numbers have been going up every year. We were actually in the playoffs that year. We were actually about to make the. We actually had made the playoffs that year, um, and. I was going to take the DNA test because I'm like, man, I just want to get back on the court. But I signed with uh, Leon Rose, who's actually with the with the um, with the Knicks right now too. He's like the he's running the show over there now, and he's like, you know, let me think about that. So he went and talked to some people, and he came back, and he's like, nah, I don't think you should do that. I don't think you should take a DNA test because I think you kind of setting you setting a precedence that could probably uh, affect some things negatively for a lot of you know African Americans coming through the league. Um, you know, for them to test you to see if you um, could possibly develop heart disease, like he's like, it's highly likely that you could because you're African American, and so could a lot of these other African Americans coming in the league. And if you let them do that, then you know that could open the door for them to say, hey, that testing, you know, could possibly save lives, blah blah blah. And so I was like, man, you know, that's that's kind of heavy. I don't really want to do that. And and then also, um, it was like it was one of those things where they were like, you know, if you test positive for it, We'll give you like I want to say it was like three hundred thousand for the rest of your life, three hundred thousand a year for the rest of your life. Right. I actually looked it up. They mm -hmm. offered you four hundred thousand per year for right. fifty years right. if you took the test and failed it. Yeah, but the thing was, the crazy thing was, like my agent had did the math because he like he's a super like he was a lawyer before all of this. Leon Rose, he was a crazy super lawyer before all of this, but like. They had did the math on it. The Bulls owed me like uh, I don't know what it was for that next year. I had an option that year to get like five point seven or eight point whatever, whatever it was. They basically were gonna put that money up and pay me interest off that money. That's all they, they were really doing. And I kind of felt like at the time I'm like, man, I don't that don't that don't really sit well with me. I felt like that wasn't really honest of them to do that. And 
So they it, it got to a point where they were like, you know what? Well, we're not gonna play you the rest of the uh, the rest of the year, and I'm sure you're gonna pick your player option up next year, but we won't play you next year either. And then you can sit out next year also, and basically try to figure out if you're gonna play again. Um, so at that point, they were like, well, if you want, you can try to go out there and find a a, a, a trade scenario, a sign and trade scenario. And uh, if we like to sign a trade, then we'll we'll accept it. And that's what ended up happening. He went out there, and we had um, we had Denver Nuggets. The Denver Nuggets were willing to pay um, some money to get me, and then the Knicks, the, the Denver Nuggets offered like fifty two million, fifty million, and the Knicks offered fifty five million. Um, I was devastated because I mean I felt like man I had really built something in Chicago I felt like we were really we were finally winning man I was gonna get a chance to see what it was like to play in front of that crowd man and it was just it it, it just devastated me man um but at the same time I was really grateful because uh the Knicks gave me an opportunity to come and uh you know they signed me I had a bunch of stipulations in my contract where like like multiple times a year I would have to get MRIs on my heart and things like that just to make sure I was cool and I, I mean, I was always fine. And yeah, that was, that was the hard thing. Okay, so now you join the Knicks. Right. And uh, Jalen Rose is on the team. Right. So you get reunited with him. Reunited uh, Nate with Robinson Rose. is on the team as well. Get reunited with Nate. Well, I meet Nate and I get reunited with uh, Jamal Crawford because me and Jamal were in Chicago together. So we get reunited in, uh, in, in New York as well. What was it like to see uh, Nate Robinson fight uh, Jake Paul and, and watch that knockout? <laughs> Man, that was, I mean, that's, that's like, that's my brother, like, for real, for real. Like, so for me, that shit hurt. It hurt me to watch that shit, bro. I was worried. I was scared. I'm like, what the hell? Like, you know, I, I always watch fights. I've I've been to fights and stuff. I've seen guys get knocked out, and I, but I don't have any connection to them. When you're watching someone you love and you care about, and that shit happens, bro, and then you're looking at it as an exhibition fight. I'm looking at it like, oh, this is just an exhibition fight. They're not even going to really be, it's like an all-star game, but nah. So when he connected, man, and he hit him those first couple times, I was like, damn, this don't look good. And then when he went down, you know, I was I was devastated, man. I called him. He wasn't answering. He wasn't answering any of our calls. Like we really, like a lot of us are really tight with Nate, man. That was it was scary. It was scary to see that. Yeah, I mean, he ended up being okay, but it was a, a pretty bad knockout. Yeah, it was a bad knockout, man. It was. And then I, I mean, you start thinking about like, damn, man, his kids are watching this, you know. You know, I know his kids. I mean, I was there when they were all born. Like, it's just, it's it's deep. It's, it's bigger than just watching, you know, uh, this YouTube guy knock out a basketball player for me and for a lot of the other guys in the league. Yeah, man. That was, uh, well, you know, maybe this is what happens when you throw someone in a sport they're not familiar with. You could for tell sure. that he didn't really, he didn't train as a boxer. I think he just felt like I'm really athletic and that's going to get me by and yeah. that doesn't work in boxing. So. Yeah, man. I, I, me, if I was... If I'm on box, I'm gonna try. If I can't get Floyd to train me, or you know what I'm saying, like I gotta get somebody that I know for a fact is gonna give me a shot to 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 you know. And I think he felt like he was. I think he felt like he was ready. But like you said, man, like if you're not, if you don't have some sort of background in boxing, man, it's hard to to come in there in that short amount of time and develop professional type skills to even be able to take a punch, man. That's 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 hard, man. I'd be like trying to play. A NBA game, you know what I'm saying? After never playing in the NBA, like that's impossible. People don't understand how fast that game is moving and how big the guys are, how long and athletic people are in the NBA. Like that's impossible. Like people are like, man, it's easy and this and that. Like it's not easy, bro, at all. Yep. Well, you joined the Knicks uh, in 2005 and you do not have a great season that first year. Right. Why do you think that was? I think... <sighs> Man, it was so many personalities. I feel like I joined a team that was already set. You know, like they had all they were in training camp when I went there. I went there late. So when I got there, they were already, they had already drafted who they were gonna draft. They had already built their team and signed their free agents. Like they were ready, they were ready to go with that particular team. So when I came on board, I think that kind of threw a monkey wrench in the whole plan, really. And I think um it was some. It was different. I was a different kind of player. I needed the ball where I needed the ball at, and you know, and we had other guys on the team that that weren't used to playing with me. I wasn't used to playing with them. We all liked each other off the court, but on the court, it was just so much going on. You had Stephon Marbury there, who was still at the top of his game, and he felt like he needed his. 
Um, and, and and deservingly so. I mean, he's in his city. How can you not tell? How can you tell him to take a back seat or to take second fiddle? Like that's not gonna happen. You're not about to tell Stephon Marbury in New York City at that time to be like, yo, it's not gonna happen. Like that's one of the first people. It's so funny because I tell people this story all the time. That's the first person I saw when I got there. Like we met in training camp in Charleston, and I get off the elevator, and he's just. It's like he was waiting on me to get off the elevator, and he's like, big fella. We're going to have a good year, but every time you get the rebound, you're going to pass it to me. And I'm just like, what kind of what kind of shit is that? So I remember calling Jamal like, man, is this how he is? Like, this is this Steph, man? Like, that's crazy. And Jamal like, yeah, man, it's Steph, man. But, you know, Steph is a – he's an incredible guy. He's a legend. So, you know, but but it's, it's things like that, bro. Um, the other big guy that they had, Jerome James, my guy Jerome. I mean, they, they drafted him right after having a good playoff run. Um, and he had the intentions on going to New York and being the starting big man for them and everything. And it didn't happen because I came and, of course, I was going to start. They gave me the big deal. So, I mean, it was a lot, man. It was a, it was a it was a big change. It was a big adjustment. I think Larry Brown was an awesome guy, but um, it just didn't work. It just didn't work with him and that team. And then I think him and him and Isaiah had friction and stuff. So, I mean, it was a lot. Well, uh, that same year, 2005, that's when you married uh, Patrice? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And you had been married once before already? Yeah, I got married in high school. I got married. You got married in, in high school? Yeah, you didn't know that, Vlad. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't do your homework. Nah, uh, yeah, I got married in high school, bro. I got uh, married, I want to say my senior year, I think. Got married. She uh, she got pregnant with our, uh, our, our, our son, my oldest. And uh, yeah, we got married right away. Got got uh went to the went to the without my parents knowing. Went to the courthouse and and they let us get married, man. Okay, and when'd you get divorced? I mean, I tried to get a divorce right away, but she drugged that shit out, bro. Honestly, like that ended up being for real, like one of the worst things I ever did in my life. Honestly. Okay, because you get married, I'm assuming there's no prenup. <laughs> No pre in high school. In high school. And then right afterwards, you signed a $14 million deal. Yes. So when that divorce happened, what, what happened financially from that? I was fucked up. I mean, mm. everything you could think happened, happened. Like, I can remember, like, uh, my agent. I remember I remember telling my agent, because I always kept it a secret, because I was really embarrassed of it, because I felt like, I felt like, I felt like such an idiot that I let her do that to me. Like, and I, and I don't want to put it all on her, because it takes two to do it. But I really felt like I was doing the right thing. Um, you know, I was having a son. Me and her went back. Went, me and her were, were, were best friends from from way back. But, um, you know, we definitely clashed a lot. Our attitudes, our personalities were, were way different. And I assumed that I'd be able to just walk away from this because we were friends and that I figured she wouldn't, she wouldn't try to gouge me. She wouldn't try to, like, I remember my agents telling me, like, man, the best case scenario is you can get this annulled. But if not, you gonna you gonna have to pay some serious money, and I'm like, man, no way. This is my friend. We go way back since third grade. There's no way she gonna try to. Shit, man. She took. Well, I was paying her sixteen thousand a month. Like, and it, and, and and it was crazy how it happened, bro. It was just it was just so much. Like, it was so much, man. It was. It probably went on for like because what she was doing. She was basically letting. She was basic. Everything was marital property which I didn't know, which I figured out. But like, I was signing all these deals. I was signing something with some car company wanted to sign me. And then all of the big trading car companies, Upper Deck, Fleer, Sage, all of the big time companies were signing me to everything. Nike, all that shit was marital property. So, um, and so she let it drag out for, for years. That divorce drug out for probably, probably two years, bro, honestly. Um, it was times where you know, she would come to court and say that she was pregnant right when the judge was going to rule and say, all right, we're going to rule today. And then she would say, well, me and him had sex and I think I might be pregnant. So then the judge is like, well, we need to take a recess and rejoin when we do this and that. And then finally they was like, look, you're going to have to give us a blood test or something because we don't really because I'm, I'm telling my I'm telling my my lawyer like, man, she's lying. Like I didn't even do nothing with her. It's, it's no way she's pregnant. So it got to the point where my lawyer is like, man, all right, well, we we need to demand a blood test or something. She got to at least prove to us that she's pregnant for you to keep just because he's got because the whole time they're like, bro, don't buy a car. Don't buy a house. Like, that's why I was literally living like 
living like a crab, like living like a hermit crab. I would go to my mom's crib. You know, I would I would live in hotels. I would rent little condos here and there, but I I I never had a crib at that point. Um, and I would, but I mean, I still would buy stuff here and there because I just I was young and I didn't I still didn't understand the gravity of the whole shit. But eventually, um, they were like, "Man, you need to take a, a, a you need to take a test to make sure you're pregnant." Then she came in there and said she had a miscarriage. So then the judge, like, yeah, the judge kind of kept it going. Um, but yeah, man, I ended up having to pay her like. 16,000 a month in like uh child support plus another like eight or nine thousand in alimony. Like it was crazy. I had to pay alimony for about four years, I had to buy her a house, buy her a car. And I'm like, man, this is crazy. Like we never lived together. We never we never even we never really spent the night together, not in any of my places. It was crazy. It was it was it was really crazy. Even to this day, bro, she literally like, it's so deep, bro. Like, it's so deep, man. Like, I'm telling you, bro, it's so deep. Like, it's deep, bro. I don't even know where to start. It's it's deep, bro. It's deep. Like, to this day, bro, she's she's trying to get my pension right now. She's wow. going after my pension. She just took me to court to try to get my pension, bro. She, uh, a year a year before my son, a year, like, probably months, a couple months before my son turned 18. Now, I've been asking her, like, me and him have been asking her for years, like, man, just let me, just let me get my son, man. He's acting out in school. Let him come. To, let him come with me. I will still give you child support. Just let him come to me. She wouldn't let him come to me. Um, a couple months before, a few months before he turned eighteen, right before his senior year, out of nowhere, I get a call like, Dad, she kicking me out. I'm like, huh? Kicked him out. He come. He she lets him. She finally lets him come come live with us. He goes. He, he uh attends his senior year out here a couple months later, not even a month later, I'm getting served with papers for back child support because I never went in and cha- and modified my child support from 16,000. And I, and I had been giving her money the whole time. I would just give her cash, I would send it to her account, um, but I wasn't paying it through the state, like whenever. So they basically went in and said, all right, well, you didn't pay the state of Illinois. So basically you didn't give her nothing. And I'm telling the judge, like, look, I got documents. These are these are receipts from cashiers, checks. These are this is over a million dollars I've given this girl. They're like, no, nah, that was a gift. If you didn't give it to the state of Illinois, that was a gift. I'm like, are you serious? Wow. Yeah, bro. So they 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 hit me with a crazy. This this just happened. They hit me with a crazy tap. You know what I'm saying? And now she's going after my 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 uh, pension. She's trying to go after my pension. And I'm like, that's. But it is what it is, you know, like, I feel like, you know, I blame myself because I, you know, I, I should have did the right thing and went in the court and modified my child support. But I believed her for some reason when she was telling me it was cool. Just, you know, just, you know, I know you ain't making 12 million a year. So, you know, just give me 5,000, just give me 6,000, just give me whatever. So that's what I was doing. And yeah, man, and she she told them people that the, that the judge allowed them to say it was a gift, man. It was crazy. Well, you get remarried. Uh in 2005 to right. Patrice. Right. Um, you know, you guys have uh, four kids together, right? Right. Um, and you're going on with your career at this point. Uh, by 2006, Isaiah Thomas becomes a coach of the Knicks. Right. Uh, did that make a big difference? You mean, uh, hell yeah, it did. Um, I think I think people got to understand why he became coach of the team. Like it, it, it just began. It just started to be become more and more of a pressure situation for everybody. Um, because at the time when I got there, he was like the GM of the team. He was like the he was the president of the team. He bought in me. He bought in a, a bunch of guys. He bought in Larry Brown. Um, and I think at some point, the owner was like. Shit, you run the show. This you put this shit together, so you you know you run it. So then he started being the president and the, the coach, and I just think he felt a lot of pressure. We always feeling the pressure to try to make something happen. They were booing us every night in the garden. That was that was uh, <laughs> that was that was tough to deal with, man, for real. Yeah, I mean the Knicks hadn't won a championship since. I mean, when was the last year that the Knicks actually won the finals? Shit, you tell me. Back when. I don't know. Clyde, was it Clyde Frazier? Here we go. I just looked it up. I, I thought it was this. It was the year I was born, 1973. That's what I'm saying. Who Was it Clyde Frazier out there with them? Or, I, I think so, like, man. Like, come on, man. Like, that's a, that's a hell of a drought. 
And Knicks yeah. fans, they don't play that shit, bro. Like, that's a serious town. Like, they'll love you hard, man, but they'll hate you just as hard, bro. Like, it's crazy. Well, I mean, by, by 2006, you actually had, you know, some strong numbers. Yeah. Uh, you know, 19.6 uh, points per game, 7.1 rebounds. Um, you actually started 81 games. Yeah. Uh, so, so you're doing well. Uh, but then in 2007, when you show up to training camp, you were just really overweight. Yeah, man, it's crazy because I want to say uh, was that the year was that the year Zach Randolph came? I think so. Yeah, I think that was the year Zach came. Man, that's when I really start. Honestly, that's when I start experiencing like knee problems. I kind of like tweaked my knee at the end of the season, and I thought it was no big deal. And I didn't. I tried to kind of keep the same regiment that I normally would have, which was I would chill. Half the summer, I was just chilling, really. Just letting my body bounce back from the summer. And then I would just go hard right before the season started. And I would use training camp as a way to really get myself into shape like a lot of guys would do. Um, this is pre-LeBron and all this stuff where dudes got these living trainers and stuff like that. Like, guys kind of had it down to a science. I got this long to chill, and then I'll ramp it up, you know what I'm saying, around this time. Well, I mean, it just... It was harder to do at that time because my knee was hurting a little bit and I just kind of, you know, it was hard to bounce back. It honestly was hard to bounce back. And then at that point, I think we got Zebo, um, and we just really kind of didn't mesh well together. Um, that along with all of the off the court shit, man, I, I mean, it takes a toll on you. Right, because I think that year you were making 10 and a half million. Right. And you're supposed to get 11 million next year. So it was kind of affecting the Knicks salary cap, you yeah. know, and since, you know, you were making so much and, you know, you were a little overweight and the team wasn't winning. It's like the fans were, like you said, like they will love you, but they'll absolutely hate you at the absolutely. same time. Yeah. And I, and I get that. I understand it. I mean, they still show me love when I go to New York. Like I get a whole lot of love in New York. Um, but so I understand, man, I understand what it's like to have your favorite team and just, and it just want them to win. And, Hey, man, if you helping us win, great. I'm your number one fan. But if you're not, man, get the hell out of here. Get out the way. So I get it, man. I get it. I'm not mad at all. Now, was it this year that you scored your second three-pointer, like, in the history of your career? Probably I guess you're so, two yeah, in Milwaukee. Right, yeah, against Milwaukee yeah. Uh, when they went into overtime. And I guess your throughout your entire career, You've gotten two for two. I'm 100 percent, baby. I'm 100 percent. I'm 100 percent. But you do not. You, you, I guess you just never shoot three pointers. This is before. Like this game now is different, Vlad. Like honestly, like so many guys, I, it wasn't just an anomaly. Like a lot of dudes could shoot. Like it's the NBA. Like of course I could shoot. Like I'm a professional basketball player. You know what I mean? But my what I did very very well was use my strength and my size close to the basket, rebound, put put balls up. Like that's kind of that's kind of more so how you played back then. Like you kind of stuck to what you what you uh like your makeup was. Um but yeah, I mean I was able to shoot the ball. I had a really good touch. I think that's what and it's crazy because that's what attracted a lot of the teams to me early on, but just when you get in those positions, man, coaches want to win. They don't got time to experiment and try to figure out who can shoot and who can make shots. They got their shooters, they got their big men, and that's just kind of how they you know, how they did it back then. Well, that same year, that's when the home invasion happened? Yep. That okay, summer. so tell me, how, tell me how that came around. Man, it was crazy. Uh, basically, I had a driver. Um, I had a driver and uh, pretty sure, I mean, I know it was an inside job. I'm not going, I'm not going to give away the names and stuff because, you know, but I had, me, my wife and I, the driver, and uh, one of my, my 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 assistant at the time, my one of my good good friends, one of my great friends, and another great friend uh, who was uh, who who's also an NBA player. We all went to dinner. Um, my wife and I had just came back from. Uh, I want to say we were we went we what was it a wedding anniversary or something. We did something. We came back from out of town. So we come back from out of town. We go to dinner. I had a bootleg copy of uh, 300. And I'm like, man, we about to watch 300 at the crib after dinner. So we head into the crib to watch 300. And and my guy calls and is like, 
yo, we're not going to come to the crib. We're going downtown, so-and-so. Such and such just called me and told me to come downtown. I'm like, all right, that's cool. I thought it was weird, but I ain't think it was weird like that. I'm just like, okay, that's fine, whatever. Because we had, we all had plans on literally, we were super excited to watch 300. So um, we go to the house, the driver pulls up to the house, and um, me and my wife get out the car and we go in the house. I go in the basement to where the theater was, and you know, I'm watching 300. My wife is upstairs in the room. My aunt's, my auntie's there. Like I got a bunch of family over because we all watching 300. My auntie, my cousins and stuff. So like maybe like 10 minutes into the movie, um, I, I hear like some people coming down the stairs and I'm not really thinking too much of it, but I'm, I'm, I am noticing that it's kind of weird because nobody should really be here. You know, it's, 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 it's late out, it's, it's late at this time, probably like 10, 11 o'clock at night. Um, and I see my driver come down and he's got his hands like um, duct taped together. And I seen some blood like coming down his face and I seen some dudes behind him. I'm like, what the fuck is this shit? So my aunt immediately, she thinks it's like one of my other friends, my friend Mike Mike. She like, Mike Mike, stop playing. Cause they immediately come down with their guns out like, yo, everybody get down. They told everybody to lay down in front of the the the, the, the screen. So I'm like, auntie, just just lay down. Just do what they ask you to do. So they had all of us lay down. And she like, Mike, Mike, you playing? I'm like, auntie, that is not Mike, Mike, dude. It's like, I am not whoever this Mike, Mike dude is. I'm like, just please lay down. So they like, take me to where the stuff is. So I'm, I go upstairs. I'm not, I'm already knowing I got to go to my room because that's where we just came from vacation. We just came from the wedding reception, whatever we came from. But all my jury was like in a traveling like Louis Vuitton case and I had probably like 30,000 in cash or something like that. And I take him to the room. My wife is just getting out the shower. Luckily she had like her pajamas on and stuff. And I'm like, man, just calm down. They just want the stuff and then they are gonna get out of here. And she's like, man, what are y'all doing? What are y'all doing? Like she, my wife is getting an attitude with him. I'm like, yo, calm down before you get us killed up here. So, uh, so, it was weird because the dude immediately gets on the phone with somebody and he's asking me for the stuff. Yeah, where's the watch at? Where's the big Jacob at? Where's the where's the Eddie Curry piece with the this and that? Like he's literally, he knows all my jury. Cause I had mm. just came, like I told you, I just came from vacation. And I took my trainer with me. Um, and they knew he knew everything I had. So he's literally naming the, all of the stuff. So I'm giving him all of the stuff. I'm I'm knowing right away, like, oh, this is some BS. I know, I know this has something to do with this dude with, with my trainer. So they get all of the stuff. They ended up uh they ended up leaving the house. They walk us back downstairs, they tie they tie us all up, they tell us to count to what they say, count to 60, and then y'all can get up. So we count to 60, we just laying there like, damn. I think I immediately, I immediately just took all my shit off took all the tape off because they didn't really tape me up good. So I, I immediately just pulled myself out and just kind of went to where my gun was and just in case they came back. And like literally the first call I made was to Isaiah Thomas. I told him like, man, I just got robbed, man. So he immediately sent like police to my house, like off duty police. Cause this was like maybe three weeks, three or four, maybe three weeks before I was due to go back to New York to start the season. Um, so he sent off-duty police to the house. The next call, the first call that I got, though, was from the trainer. He calls me, and he says, hey, man, um, I heard what just happened, and I'm, and I'm talking to the people who got your stuff. They'll give it back to you for 50000 And wow. I'm like, what? I said, man, tell them to keep that shit. And I hung up the phone. So then I called my friend, right? And I'm like, now, mind you, they know each other. They went to kick it with the trainer. The trainer had called them. They told me, like, like they like, man, it's crazy because such and such called me and told us before we got, he asked us what we were doing. We said, yo, we eating with Eddie, and we about to go to his house and watch 300. And he was like, nah, don't go to his house. Come downtown and hang with me. And they like, nah, we already promised him. We going, we literally following him right now. We at this split where we can either go to the city or go to his house. He like, no, come downtown. So him and the pro the pro player went to went downtown to meet up with the dude while I was getting robbed. I said, yo, it's crazy because I told my friends, I said, yo, they was on the phone with somebody and dude was telling them everything that I had. 
Like he was literally calling out, like, get the get the watch. Oh, his wife got this big ring and his wife got this. Like he knew everything we had. I said, bro, it, it had to be him. Even they agreed. They're like, yo, that's crazy. He told us don't come there. It had to be him. So I'm like, yo, we finna go to the police station because we had to go do the police report and stuff. I said, bro, just come here and tell them exactly what you told me. They come to the police station and they won't tell the police nothing. And I'm like, what? Now this is this is my guy. Like these are like when I tell you this is my guy, like this is my guy from like third grade. This is my the guy that's in the league is like, I'm talking about when he got drafted, I would give him I gave him a car just to drive while he was in Chicago because he wasn't from Chicago. So I gave him a car. Like this is like these are my people. And I'm like, bro, all you gotta do is tell them because the police, by the time they got done with the investigation and everything, they knew that he was on the phone with them. All they needed was them to say, like, yeah, he had them do this, blah, blah, blah. But they wouldn't do it. They had triangulated the calls. They knew everything. They seen the people because they caught the dudes. The same dudes that robbed me robbed Antoine Walker. We all were working out at the same gym. We all were working out with Tim Grover. And it was, you know, one of his trainers. One of his trainers was the one who was kind of putting all of the people on the athletes to rob them. Wow. Okay, they finally catch the guys who did it and charge. They caught them, the guys who did them. They they still in jail right now. Oh, how long they get? I don't know how. I don't know. I didn't keep up with that. I don't know. Probably like fifteen years or something like that. Some twenty years maybe. I mean, these guys came into your house and duct tape everybody, and yeah. I mean, this is. I mean, this is a very serious, serious. Oh, for situation. sure, and they, and they did Antoine Walker the same way, like because literally, like I, I talked to Twan. And he's like, what happened? I explained to him the whole situation. He said, bro, they did me the exact same way. Like, to a T, bro, they did every single thing exactly the same, to even to the point where they got on the phone with the trainer dude. The trainer dude was telling him everything he had. And they pistol whipped his friend. They tied him, they tied uh, Twan to a chair, I think, because it was only him and his friend there or something like that. But yeah, it was the same, it was the same dude. So the trainer ended up getting convicted also? or No, he, nothing happened to him because nobody would tell. Nobody would talk. Huh. Wow. Nobody would talk, man. He was sending me pictures okay. of, the, of, the, of the jury and stuff. Like, it was crazy. And everything, you... I, I even told Twan, I was like, bro, he, he literally called me. He was the first person that called me and said, I can get your shit back. I'm like, man, keep that shit. And he said, bro, he did the same thing to me. So did you ever get your stuff back or no? No, I didn't get it back because I wouldn't buy it. I'm not, I'm not, no, but I'm saying, but after the guys got arrested and everything, they never found no, this stuff. No, no, that, shit, yeah. that shit's in the streets, bro. They ain't giving that yeah. shit back. Okay, so so that happens. Luckily, no one was harmed. Right. Well, the driver got, he got, he got a uh, pistol yeah. whip, but yeah, okay, nobody. Yeah. The, the driver got that. pistol yeah. whip, but no one got shot or killed or anything No, else. no, no, no. Okay, so then 2008 rolls around and you go in training camp out of shape again. Mm-hmm. Um, the head coach, uh, Mike D'Antino. Mike D'Antoni. D'Antoni, sorry. Yeah. Uh, wasn't your biggest fan? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. And, and I guess that year you actually lost your uh, your starting job. Yeah. How did that feel? Um, I mean, I, I lost it because I got hurt. I, I ended up getting, like, during that time, I had knee surgery. Like, I had knee surgery, one or two knee surgeries that summer. So I really, I mean, I knew what was going to happen. The writing was on the wall. I mean, I think they got it. They bought in Amari Stoudemire at that point, which was his old, which was his player that he had in um in uh, Phoenix when he was coaching him, which, I mean, Amari was, he was still dope as hell anyway, so I get that. And, I mean, I wasn't ready to go. I mean, I'm not. I'm not gonna put the blame on nobody. I was I was hurt, had to have my surgery. I wasn't ready to go. Um, so yeah. Um at one point, he at one point, you know, I was ready to go though. And he was like, I'm not playing him. We had meetings with him, uh, with my with my agent and with the GM at the time, Donnie Walsh. And he's just like flat out, I'm I'm not playing him. I don't care what he does, I don't care what kind of shape he's in, I'm not playing him. And so at that point, um, we like, well, how are we supposed to get a trade if you won't play him? You got to at least play him so that we can get a trade. And he was like, I don't care. I'm not playing him. So, I mean, that was kind of how that went with, with D'Antoni. Well, 2009 rolls around. Uh, Tracy McGrady joins the Knicks. Right. And at that point, you're actually working with a trainer and you start to lose a lot of weight. You lost like 30 pounds. Yeah. 
So you started to get back back in shape. Um, I mean, at that point, did things start to improve for you? Nah, he wasn't playing me. He already said he wasn't playing me. It was already understood he was not gonna he was not gonna play me. At that point, I knew I had to just be in shape for whatever was coming next. Okay, and then some some very interesting and tragic things start to happen around this time. So first of all, you end up getting sued by your former chauffeur, right, uh, David uh, Kaczynski. I'm not gonna say his name because. Uh, I did a piece, bro, with the Players Tribune, the people who I got my podcast with now. We did a piece on me and just kind of talking about all the stuff that I had went through in my life. And um, I want to say his name came up or just the situation came up. And he tried to, he tried to, you know, sue us again. So I personally won't say his name. I'll say that I had a, a pilot and that the pilot, you know, the pilot definitely, uh, he definitely sued me for sure. Okay, so so this man right. uh, sued you for soliciting sex from him. He's saying nah. that on two times you, appro- you approached him in the nude saying, look at me, come and touch it, Dave. <laughs> he also claimed that you used racial slurs, and he claimed you owed him 68000 in unpaid wages, 25000 in expenses. I mean, this just sounds like a ridiculous situation. Yeah, right? like, I don't know exactly, like, I don't know exactly, like, I don't know the details of the suit, but I could tell you, like, I mean, me and, me and that person, bro, like, it's 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 one of them things, bro, like, I just should have listened to people, honestly. Like, when I first went to the Knicks, I met him when I first went to the Knicks. And, um, like I told you, I went there late. I was there in training camp, so we leave training camp and go straight to New York. I didn't have any cars. I didn't have any cars there or anything, so... They had a car service take me places. So the very first person, the very first car service that took me somewhere, this person was the driver for that car service, that that company. I felt so comfortable with him, like he was telling me his whole life story, like on the way to the games and stuff. And I just felt like giving him a chance. He told me he had a past. He told me that, you know, you know, things had been hard for him. And, you know, he told me that he had actually, you know, went to jail and things were turning around for him. And I just felt like, man, let me give him a shot. So I'm like, man, you know what? I'm gonna hire you. I, it started off as me requesting him. Every time they would give me a driver, I'm like, yo, let me get him. Cause I, I felt comfortable with him, let me get him. And it went from that to, man, how much do you get paid, bro? Let me just, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna double your salary. I just want you to be my driver. And he became like, you know, he became my my friend. He was like a, a, a great friend. He would come in the summertime, like after the season was over, I would pay him year round. He would come to the, he would come to my house. He would um he had a room in my house. He played with my kids. Like this was a part of my family. He was a part of my family, bro. Um it came a time though where he he started he started to build his own family. Like he had his own family. He had a I think a daughter already, but he met somebody else and they were having a child together or had just had a child together. So he was trying to not do as much stuff with me um on the work side because he wanted to try to do something that would allow him to be home more, especially in the summers and stuff like that. So I understood that I wasn't tripping about that. And I actually he actually had me write him a recommendation. Um, I wrote him a recommendation. I actually let him write the recommendation. I signed it or whatever. Um, and he got the job with the people. Now, for some reason, he get he gets fired by the people. I don't know, I don't, I don't know what happened between him and them, those people, but he got fired from that job. Um, and so I was in, I was in New York at the time. Um, I think the season was going, yeah, the season was going on. And I was with, and, and at the time, my my assistant was the same dude who did the insurance thing, right? So, but this is before the insurance thing. It might have been the same year, but just earlier in the year or something like that. So he's like, so so the driver starts calling me first, like, man, you know, I'm, I, I got fired, bro. Can I get my job back? I'm like, mm, I don't really need a driver. You know, my guy is driving me now, kind of. And plus my family's not here no more because at the time Patrice and the kids, they just stayed in Chicago because like the writing was already on the wall. They was only coming, they was only there to go to the games and, you know, really support me and stuff. But when I when they knew I wasn't playing, we didn't rent a big house. We kind of, you know, 
just uh, downgraded in New York so I could have minimal things. I knew a trade was going to come any day now. So she stayed back in Chicago. I'm like, I don't need a driver, bro. Like, I'm sorry, but I can't I, I can't justify hiring a driver again, bro. And I'm like, and when I go back to Chicago, Patrice don't really think we need a driver there either. So I'm like, you know, like, no, nah, I can't do it. But it goes from him, you know, asking for his job back to kind of demanding his job back. And when it got to that point, I stopped even responding to him. So then he starts hitting my guy, my right hand guy, my 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 uh, manager dude, and and he used to show me the messages like, man, look at this shit, man. Dude is like, he's trying to turn up with me. He's trying to get crazy with me. Like, man, you know, tell Eddie if he don't, you know, hire me, then I'm going to do this. I'm going to tell Patrice that, you know, he used to have me pick up girls and do this and do that. And I'm like, bro, tell him to fuck off, bro. So then it goes from that to like, if he don't hire me, you know, he was only, he would pay me cash. And he he never paid taxes on the money that he gave me. So if he don't hire me then, or if he don't give me this amount of money, I'm going to report him to the IRS or something. And at this point, we just laughing. And I'm like, man, do what you got to do, bro. I don't even care. So it goes from that. It goes silent for a while, bro. And I'll never forget. I was in um, Dallas. We were playing the Mavericks. And I'm walking out the, I'm about to walk out the locker room at the end of the game. And our PR guy is like, uh, have you heard of, and he said his name. He's like, you know, and I'm like, yeah, of course I know him. He's like, well, uh, he's suing you and the vultures are here. And I look around and all the media is just right there. I'm like, what? So he shows me the article and I'm just like, what? Like, it, of course it's like, oh, gay this and that. I'm like, oh, that's crazy. So I had to like, you know, address it. And then I just, I don't know. It was crazy, man. But yeah, he ended up suing me, bro. Um, I ended up having to pay him, bro. And it was crazy to me because I'm like, why do I, I, I never understood why, why I had to pay him. Like that was, it just was the craziest thing, man. And I remember, I remember they made me like before the, before the case was over, the judge like demanded that we have like a mediation time with just me and him in the room. And I'm just like, so he, he passes me this card, right? This bat, this, ba this basketball card of mine with some like weird story like, man, I remember when I first drove you and this and that, and I found this card when I was cleaning the car out. And, you know, I just wanted to give it back to you, man. I never meant for any of this to happen. Like he's apologizing to me. And I'm sitting here like, bro, you did all of this and you gonna apologize? Like, that's crazy, bro. You got me out here looking crazy, bro. Like, I'm like, man, whatever, bro. Only reason I'm here is because the judge made me do this. Like, this don't even make no sense. At the end of this, I still got to give you that dollar amount and it is what it is, bro. So I ended up having to pay him, bro, like six figures. For six some, figures. Six figures, bro. Awesome. And not and not a hundred thousand. And not two hundred thousand. I had to pay him six figures, bro. Yeah, I mean, listen, I I've been through lawsuits myself. I've been sued, and I remember being in arbitration as well. And and I remember us saying, This is bullshit. This person is lying. This person is lying, bro. And, and and the arbitrator said, the truth doesn't matter. We're just here to get to a number. That's it. That's all they cared about. That's all they cared about, man. And at that time, at that point, bro, I had been in the court system enough, like with my ex and just different things. I kind of knew how it was going to work. I was just devastated. Like, man, I can't believe he would do that to me. Like, we really, like, I really was his number one fan. Like, I was the guy. When everybody was like, yo, this is a bad idea, don't hire him. Like literally when we first hired him, when I first decided to hire him, I had a I had a, a team, my team consisted of private investigators. So they did a they did a background check on him. They're like, bro, this dude got multiple felonies. Like, don't hire him. I'm like, bro, I know I don't care what he has. I'm telling you he a good dude. I'm hiring this dude, bro. And it was it was a bad decision, bro. For real, for real. And like, it's just crazy because it's funny. Like, even my own homies would be like, man, what, what, why was you saying that gay shit to him? Like, bro, I ain't, like, bro, y'all know me better than that, bro. It, I'm a lot of things, bro. But, and I don't got no problem with gay people, but I'm not, I'm clearly not gay, bro. Like, it's just crazy. You know, like, and it was funny because the shit he would put in there, bro. Like, my wife's dad, right? He's from Belize, right? So he would, he would, they had a playful relationship. He was a part of the family. And so it was to the point where everybody joked with him and he joked back. Like he would call 
my wife's dad like a beaner. Like he would call him these derogatory type of playful, like, like names, you know what I'm saying? Like playful dishes, something that you would never call somebody, but he would call him that. And then he would call him stuff back. But that was the shit that was in a lawsuit. You know what I'm saying? That was the type of shit that was like, oh, well, he called me this. And I was like, bro, you called him, you know, this and that. Like, what are you talking about? And y'all was joking and playing. Y'all would say this while sharing a beer and while fishing and jet skiing and shit. What are you talking about? But it was it was that type of shit. So I can't get on the stands and be like, that, first off, they didn't even ask me if I said what I said or anything. They didn't care. They didn't care about any. All they cared about, like you said, was the dollar amount. They, all they looked at was like, this how much you make per year and that money is not going to hurt you and that's just how they, that's how they did it i mean was it a a little awkward in the, in the locker room where suddenly you have these this gay lawsuit and you know the dudes are in the locker room looking at you crazy while they're showering I mean, like yo man i mean like, i mean it, it was not really because they knew me you know what i'm saying my teammates know yeah. me and they knew him and most of them didn't like him you know what i'm saying mm. He was like, everybody know everybody. Like, I know all Nate's people, all his homies, all his assistants, all his, I know all them, and they know all my people. And everybody, to a man, was always like, bro, get rid of this dude. Like, what are you doing with him? But I'm just like, no, that's my homie, bro. Like, he weird, he's different, but that's my homie, bro. No, I'm not getting rid of him. And that's just kind of how it was. But yeah, I mean, people that, people that, like, people that, like, knew me, but that's how I knew that, other people in the league probably were thinking that shit, but they would never say that to me because I smacked the shit out of somebody. But they would never, but they would never say that to me just because I I knew it was being said because my homies would playfully say some shit like that, and that, and I'm just like, man, y'all funny, ha ha ha. But but they knew better though. My homies, they my teammates, they know better. Well, while you're married, you end up having an affair. Yeah. Uh, with Nova Henry, uh, who's actually the sister of Ryan Henry from Black Ink Crew. Yeah. And in the process of this affair, you end up having two kids. Mm -hmm. Did your wife know about this affair at all or no? Man, we got a long history. I mean, because you got to think, bro, like me and Nova, me and Nova went to high school together. And, um, so, like, I've been... She was like my best friend, honestly, bro. Like she was my best friend. She was like a just incredible person, bro. So throughout the whole time, like throughout the whole time of like Patrice and, and my relationship, I mean, it was infidelity there with not only Nova, but other, you know, women that she knows about. But it's, I mean, she didn't know at the time. I, didn't, I, I wasn't like telling her like, hey, I did this, but you know, Somehow, some way, she just always found out, bro. It was crazy. But um, but no, nah, man, Nova, um, she was, I mean, she was she was special to me. And um it was it was hard to it was hard to let each other go, I think, at, at, at one point. Even though she knew that my life was going in this direction and her life was going in that direction, it was, it was, it was difficult. Um but before she passed, we, you know, we definitely had agreed that it was more important that we raise these children um, the right way, that they be um, a part of my other kids, that they know their brothers and sisters. And we can't do that while we having these these relationships, these, you know, these encounters with each other. We got to keep it above ground. And um, and it's just crazy that as we come to that, that that's when, you know, tragedy happens. Right. So. You guys have a three-year-old son together. Right. And a nine-month-old daughter. Right. She has a lawyer named Frederick Goings. Right. That was actually working with her at the time, but I guess the two of them had some sort of relationship uh, as well around that time. And something happens and Nova gets killed as well as your nine month old daughter. Yeah, Ava. Um, it's crazy, man, because um, when, when Nova and I were going through our um, paternity case and everything, she didn't really want to do it. Um, Cause she, 
unlike my my ex, like it was like I said, it was different, man. And she really was doing that because she was listening to people. Like she knew it wasn't even it wasn't even necessary. It wasn't necessary for my ex to do that. I would have given her and my son anything. Um, but she kind of just did it because she kind of felt like that that was the way to go. Like that was how things had to go. Um, eventually, though, she realized that wasn't, and she dropped it. She dropped the she dropped the suit. She um, you know we talked to each other and. And we 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 squared all that shit away, bro. Like, we really made peace with everything that had that had went on. Um, at the time, I was keeping all of that a secret from my wife. You know, it was stuff that she would hear because you know we both from Chicago. Um, but I was keeping all of that a secret from my wife. Um, and I don't know when that when that happened though. Uh, we had plans on. I had plans on, you know, explaining to my wife, man, all the shit you heard is is definitely true, and she knew of. She knew of Noah, she knew of Ava, but I won't, you know, I was definitely at a moment, at a, at a place where I'm like, yo, we, I, I gotta, I gotta bring them around. You know, this is my family. And we just didn't have a chance to do it how we assumed that it would happen. Cause um, yeah, Frederick, you know, he killed her. And honestly, I heard, man, like I hear bits and pieces of things, man. And I remember, I do remember that he was trying to get a bunch of money from me, that like he just drummed up a bunch of charges and he was trying to get a bunch of money from me. Like, I want to say like 80,000 or something like that. And she told me like, yo, he trying to hit you with this bill. She's like, she's like, but I, she's like, but you know, it's, it's some bullshit. I'm not signing off on that. He needs me to sign off on it to do it. I'm not signing off on that because that's some bullshit. You don't deserve that. You've been through enough blah, 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 like that money could go to, you know, the kids, that money could go to your kids over there, anything. Like she was really, it was weird, man. It was, it was, it was crazy. Like she just was making peace. I, I, I can honestly say it felt like she was really just making peace with everything. And I don't think that she knew that that shit was gonna happen. Cause I think if she did, she would have definitely had the kids out of the house. But at the same time, bro, I mean, she definitely, it, it definitely has shifted from, like things had gotten rocky between me and her for a little bit, um, and I, and that was around the time when you know she started you know dealing with the dealing with him, and he started coming at me in a different way. He's, it, it became it was weird, man. Like I know, like he, uh, I remember my, my 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 one of my best friends was at the baby shower for Ava, and he would tell me about how the dude Frederick was like walking around with a gun at the baby shower. And he's and, and and at the end of the baby shower, because they did the shower at her best friend's house. And I remember him telling me, like, man, bro, at the end of the shower, Nova was trying to like clean up and shit after the shower. And and he like, man, fuck that shit. Leave that shit. Let them do that shit. Let them bitch ass niggas do that shit. And like talking to my homeboy and my homeboy, like, I couldn't really do nothing because everybody knew he had a gun on him. So I'm just like, man, it's little things like that that you look at and you like, damn, man, like. It was the warning signs were there. I just, I mean, people didn't know and nobody ever thinks that that's going to happen. Like, that's so extreme, you know, what he did. But like I said, man, I, I feel like, I feel like he knew that she was not down with trying to, you know, basically rob me of any more money, man. And, and I do feel like that had a part to do with, you know, what happened. Well, he ends up killing her, killing your nine month old daughter, Ava. But your three-year-old son was actually there and I guess witnessed the whole thing, but was unharmed. Right. So it's just such a, a fucking tragedy just yeah. on every level. Yeah, man. Um it's fucked up, bro. Like I I don't know, bro. It's 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 fucked up, bro. Like it's one of them things, bro, where it seem it just don't seem it still doesn't seem real to me, you know? It doesn't matter how many times, like immediately, you know, after she passed and after Ava passed, man, I went to uh, the funeral home to see them like the next next day or so. And it just still didn't seem real, man. It seemed like I was just living a bad dream. Still still kind of feels like that, even after all this time. Um, it's weird, man. Well, I guess you hadn't actually met your daughter until going to the funeral. Right. 
I had met so you her. never even got to even really experience your never, own daughter. Never held her, never, ne- nothing. Never touched her, nothing. Like I said, man, we had plans on, like, it was like, man, we're going to get the kids together, you know what I'm saying, take all the kids to, you know, Disney World. Like, we had a whole plan on how we was going to, you know, merge, merge, merge the family and do things the right way. It just literally, days later, bro, it just all went up in smoke. When your wife found out, how did she take it? Man, she was devastated, bro. Like, it was crazy. I mean, she found out from the papers. It was so many times that she asked me, like, man, just tell me the truth, man. Just, I'm less like, I can't. I was so scared that she was just going to leave. I was so scared that, like, man, I, I just didn't want to let her down. I had gotten caught cheating so many times. Shit was going so fucked up for me on the court. I just felt like, man, I cannot afford to take another L. I just can't. And I knew that losing her would be a big ass L for me, man. Like I knew I would probably not recover from that. So I'm just like, man, I gotta hold on to this lie until I felt like, I felt like I was gonna wait until I knew she wouldn't leave me for the information I was gonna tell her, honestly. Like, and I, and I just felt like every time I would kind of tell her, she'd be like, you about to tell me that, that those are your children, huh? I'm like, nah, I could tell how she would bring it to me. Like, nope, this ain't the time. So, yeah, man, it's just, it's just, you know, one of those things, man, I wish I was more mature about it. I wish I was able to, you know, just confidently just tell her, you know, because I feel like, man, I would have loved to, I feel like if I was a part of their lives, man, I could have, my daughter would still be here right now, you know, for sure. Because I would have made sure, like, I would have, I don't know, I would have protected her. I feel like I would have definitely protected her like I do, you know, all my children. Well, uh, Frederick Goings got arrested, got charged with two counts of first degree murder. It went to trial. He got life in prison. When you heard that verdict, did that bring any level of closure or not at all? No, not at all, man. I feel like that, I feel like they went easy on him. I feel like he needed to like for what he did, bro. Like, man, give him to me, man. That's how I felt. Give him to me, man. Let me let me figure it out. And it's a lot of people that felt like me. I know her brother feels that way. I know we, man, we would have did. I would have gladly dismembered that guy and went to jail and said I did it. Like, for real. I was ready to throw it all away. Like, I remember when it first happened that the police were like, he's on the loose. Um, we're tracking him. He th- he's in Indiana right now. He might be coming your way. I'm like, let him come. Shit. But they ended up catching him out at a hotel or something like that, bro. But it's. It's fucked up, bro. It's one of them things, bro. I just hope that uh, he's getting the, the, the justice that he needs in jail, man. Yeah, fuck that guy. Yeah. Straight up. Well, uh, was it that same year that your home went into foreclosure? I mean, it had been in foreclosure for a while. It just, you know, we were able to basically hold on to it for a while. But after a while, it's like, man, fuck that. Let that shit go. Okay, but I mean, you were still making millions of dollars. What what exactly happened? I was making millions, but man, bro, like I had, I mean, at that point, you know, I realized that my accountant wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. Um, you know, he had loans here and there. It's crazy because I, you know, I do some work with the um, with the Players Association now, and I talk to, you know, all the young kids about this type of shit, man, just um, the power of attorney, bro, and that was the biggest, that was one of the biggest things, biggest factors in my financial just ruin, bro, is that I, is that I gave someone power of attorney. And I remember at one point, like I, like toward the end of my time in New York, probably my last year there, man, um, he had he had got a loan from this dude in uh, Vegas and they didn't have any, there was no laws on, there was no cap on just the inflation, just the extra, the the like the late fees, late penalties and shit like that that you can charge for a loan. He took out a loan. He used a, a stamp of my signature to get the loan. He defaulted on the loan. I didn't even know about it. Didn't get the proceeds from it or anything. They ended up taking me to court. It was like a $500,000 loan. I ended up having to pay like $4 million on this loan. And so, I mean, that fucked me up. And then it happened at a time where I didn't have $4 million, $4 million in cash. 
So I had to do all this crazy shit. I had to run my fucking the rest of my contract through another firm to get the money to for them to give me the money to pay him so that the money just didn't keep gaining interest because they were still gonna be gaining interest on the money. Like shit just shit was fucked up. Right, because by 2010 there was reports that said that even though you had made 57 million during your nine years in the NBA, you were currently broke and actually two million in debt at that point. I mean, I don't know who makes who makes the numbers up. I don't, you know, I'm sure I don't, uh, I wouldn't say I'm, well, shit, right now, I mean, you, you t if you ask my baby mother, yeah, if you ask my, my ex, she'll tell you I'm a, I'm a million in debt for sure. Yeah, I mean, that's crazy. I mean, to to take a, because I actually looked up, it's a $585,000 loan that he took out in 2008. Right. That balloons into $4 million, and then you have to basically get an advance on your salary, which has an interest rate according to that as well. So it's interest on top of interest yeah. on top of interest on all compounded together. It, it's and just I had a nightmare. To pay, and I had to pay the people because I had to pay the people who gave me the loan to pay him. You know what I'm saying? So that was, I mean, and like I said, this was at the end of my career. This was at the end of me making the most money that I had made in the league after realizing that, damn, my accountant had been fucking me up this whole time. So it was it was one of them things, bro. It was just one of them things, you know, where you you try to just try to treat it as a learning experience. Um luckily, you know, I've been able to do some things and I've been able to, you know, really leverage my 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 brand and my name to to keep, you know, shit, keep myself in a good place. Well, 2011, you get traded to the uh Timberwolves. Mhm. Mm uh, but before you actually play, you end up going to the Miami Heat? No. Nah, um, so I get traded to the Timberwolves. I had a I had a uh a trade clause on my contract where they couldn't trade me without my permission. So I get a call from I knew it was gonna happen. I knew that they were looking for a trade because it was like all over the news. It was unavoidable. They were trying to get Carmelo. So they uh they ended up Calling me one day, Donnie Walsh calls me one day, the president, and he's like, um, I know you probably heard about it, but we got an opportunity to get Carmelo, uh, but we need your contract to do it. So um, we can't make you do it, but, you know, we just I just wanted to ask you, would you be willing to uh, to sign off on a trade, you know, sign off on a trade? They were like, um, you know, I know that Minnesota wants to, they want the young guys that are involved in the trade, so you really don't even have to report to them. They'll probably they're, they're going to just probably do a buyout, um, but it's up to you. And you also have a trade kicker, which like, which I forgot how much it was, like maybe an extra like seven hundred thousand or something like that. So I'm like, yeah, man, I'm not going to hold y'all up, bro. Um, if you guys can make the team better, I'll sign off on it. And that's what I did. I signed off on the trade. Um, Talk to uh, Minnesota on the phone. They're like, yeah, um, basically, you could come here if you want to, but we're not even going to let you dress because we really just want the young guys on the team. We, we're, we're in a rebuilding mode. We ain't going to even waste your time like that. If you want, we could just give you a buyout. We'll give you all your money that's owed to you. And that's what I did. I took the I took the trade kicker from the Knicks, and I took the buyout, and then I went home. And then I want to say it was a lockout or something like that. Um, I was gonna sign with the no. I was gonna sign with the Heat that summer, uh, not that summer, for the playoffs. And I met with uh, Pat Riley, and I met with uh, all of the coaches. Everybody came in into Chicago to check me out, and they're like, you know what? We feel like if we had you for a whole season, you know, you'll be way. It, it'll be just way better for both parties. So that's what we agreed to do. We agreed to wait until the next year um, for me to go to the to the Heat. So that's what I did. It was a it was a lockout for a little while, and then after the lockout ended, I signed with the Heat. Okay, so you signed with the Heat, and that team had LeBron, mm -hmm. Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh. Yep. Was that the best team you'd ever been on? Absolutely. What are you kidding me? Yeah, hell yeah, for sure. <laughs> I mean, what was that like when you stepped onto that court? That was crazy. Um I never felt just the, I've never felt such a, like a, a duty to be ready. 
even if I knew I wasn't going to play, I knew I had to be ready. Um, just a duty to stay in shape, a duty to be in the best shape of my life, um, a duty to sacrifice to the game, bro. It, it was almost like starting all over again from when I was trying to get to the NBA, you know, uh, going through the whole AAU circuit and uh, going through all of the, the Nike camps and this and that and just putting on putting my best foot forward, even just in practice. Um, and that's and that's really what it was, man. You saw LeBron and you saw D Wade and you saw Chris Bosh, man, giving everything they had to the game. And you like, man, who am I to not come in here? And you know, what I'm saying, I'm not gonna be that guy that's that's not ready. So, yeah, I was in the best shape of my life for sure. Right, because you had lost 70 pounds by the next season. Right. And I remember, you know, we interviewed Iman Shumpert, you know, who played with LeBron as well. And he broke down how LeBron has the greatest basketball IQ of anyone he's ever played with. He has to share basketball knowledge with people. Like he's, it's, it might be his biggest superpower, his ability to get everybody on the same page. Like it's actually kind of scary. <laughs> how scary how? Like he can just, ex he can explain this game forward and back. Because he has a very high IQ, basketball IQ, right? Wow. It's unbelievable. So you talk about somebody that know the playbook, know where everybody's supposed to be, know the other team's coaches, playbook, style of coaching, how his ball club's going to play. Like, Bron's one of them where you'll be like, we going into Philly tonight. He'd be like, no, but they just hired the, the, the new defensive coach, but he was at Georgetown for three years, and I played for him one time at camp, and he, he his, this is how they're going to play us. And you'd be like, what? He was saying how in a post-game interview, he would talk about a play and literally break down what every player did and how they did it and so forth. It was just like mind blowing. Or, you know, when he, they'd be hanging out, LeBron would have like 10 screens up and taking notes and his wife would be working with him. And it, it's like, he was just a different type of player when it comes to his game, as opposed to other people. No question. I mean, playing with him, what was really different about LeBron from your point of view? Man, bro, just like you said, his detail, the detail that he put into uh, into being ready, um, the extra work that he put in, I mean, he was always working. Like, like it's like it's almost to the point like, damn, bro, when do you sleep, bro? You you would call it, like I would always get to the gym early. He was always there early. He was always there late. After games, man, he was always just taking care of his body. He took his time with it. Like I was always, me and a lot of people just were like, man, game over, let's put our clothes on, let's get the hell out of here, man. We've been here all day. But not Bron, bro. Bron's gonna ice up, Bron's gonna get his treatment. He's gonna do everything he has to do, man. It's 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 just crazy, bro. Before the games, he's gonna be reading a book. He's gonna be, he's just gonna be, I don't know, man. I've never seen somebody give so much to the game. I played for a long time. I've seen a lot of people. I could tell you about everybody's preparation. I've never seen anything like LeBron, bro. It's, it's no, it's no surprise that he is who he is and where he is, and he's been able to just play at this at, at such a high level for so long. Like it's 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 amazing. Right, and then in 2012, you guys win the NBA Finals. Right. How did that feel to be in the league that long and finally win? It was dope, but I found more joy in watching like LeBron. I never seen somebody so good. Like I played with Jamal. I think Jamal is the closest I could say I played to somebody that was like LeBron. Just in that, like he would have moments where he just couldn't miss. Like I just never seen that. I've never, I, I would experience that from time to time. Like I had periods where I would average 20 or so points over so many games. I would drop 30 here and there. But man, for a whole game, bro, to watch somebody drop 50 points, bro, like that's a lot of damn points, man. And to watch LeBron do that type of shit every single day and do it when the whole world, I can remember we were playing Boston, man. And I remember us walking down the street. I remember us, I, I remember, I didn't go with them that night, but I remember him. I remember hearing about it the next day, about how um, some fans walked up to him while we were walking in Boston, and um, and one of the fans walked up like, "Hey, LeBron! Hey, LeBron!" And he thought he was about to be like, "Hey, man, can I get an autograph or something?" He said, "LeBron, you fucking suck!" Like right to his face, bro, and it fucked LeBron up to the point where we had to tell him, "Like, man, you are LeBron James, bro." But he literally, bro, he he cares so much about. 
the game, man, and he cares so much about what people think of him, man, because he puts so much into it. He doesn't understand why people don't like him, why certain people, how somebody just couldn't like him to the point where they could come to him to his face and say, hey, LeBron, you fucking suck. Like, that's crazy to me. And that was and that was crazy. So to watch him will us to win on a nightly basis, especially in that Boston series, man, that was it was magical, man. To me, that was more incredible. And that sticks in my memory more than just, you know, winning a championship for sure. Right. And this was actually LeBron's first championship win. Right. You know, after being with the Cavs year after year and carrying that team on his back and still not winning. And finally, I remember there was a whole thing leading up to it. I remember the Knicks really wanted LeBron. You yeah. know, they had a whole ad campaign. I mean, everyone wanted LeBron. Everybody did. And Miami. he said, I'm taking, yeah. he did the press conference. I'm taking my talents to South Beach and everybody was all hurt. And then yep. they had the Heatles that next year. And then I was the year after that. Yep. Yep. I mean, and that was the first of four victories that he got, but that was the first time LeBron, I feel like, you know, because there was always the argument like, yeah, LeBron, cool, but Jordan got six rings, LeBron got zero. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's going to go down as like a Charles Barkley or an Allen Iverson who's really good but has no rings. Now, at that point, he finally won his first ring, and it's, I feel it kind of solidified him as a player. Absolutely, man. And as somebody who's, like, I've known LeBron since he was in... What was he in, like sophomore sophomore year or something like that? Because I remember as a kid, like I used to, not as a kid, but I was in the league and he would come to Chicago to play in like an AAU tournament or something like that. And I would basically have to babysit him. Like I would basically, like I would get a call from Wes, Uncle Wes, worldwide, and he'd be like, man, I got this kid coming in town. I need you to look after him, nephew. And I'm looking at it like, man, I don't, I got shit to do. This is summertime. I'm in my hometown. I could be doing this or that. But I remember getting with him, man, and I'm like, you know what? Let me go see. I remember when I first met him, like him and Maverick and Randy and Rich, all those guys were still together. And I remember they were selling, uh, they were selling throwback jerseys out of their trunk. Like they were like really trying to figure it out. And I'm just like, man, these kids are crazy. I go to the game and it's just pandemonium. I had never seen nothing like that. I'm like, man, I guess he's. Let me let me look and see if he could really play. And, like, one of the first plays of the game, he goes up to dunk, and this little kid, like, runs under him, and he breaks his wrist. And they had to escort the kid out the gym because the gym was trying to, like, tear this kid apart. And I'm like, damn, so this is this is LeBron James. Huh? So that was, like, my first introduction to who he was, man, and we've been cool ever since, man. Uh, well, at the end of that season, you end up getting traded. No, I just I signed a one-year deal. It was a one-year oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it was a okay, one year deal. Um, I ended up trying to get on with uh I think the Mavs or and uh, a little a little bit with the uh with the uh Spurs, but it just, you know, they already pretty much had a roster set and unless I was gonna do something spectacular, I wasn't gonna get on that roster. Right. And essentially that was the end of your NBA career. Right. Um you end up signing uh with the Zhejiang Golden Bulls. Hey, you said you said I'm... you said it better than I could. <laughs> okay, in, in China. Yeah, CBA team out there. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, but how did it feel at that point to really be at the end of your NBA career? Honestly, man, I was so tired of the like. You got to remember, like when I came into the league, man, like I was that guy, bro. So. I was used to starting. Like, you couldn't tell me, like, going into a game and not starting, like, that's foreign. That was foreign to me. Like, I couldn't even, I couldn't even imagine that. So, by the time I got to experience those moments with D'Antoni where you have a coach tell you that no matter what you do, you're not going to play. And then you, you know, you get on with uh, the heat. And no matter how good a shape you're in, no matter what you do in practice, you're not going to really touch the court. Um, then you get, to, you know, you go to Dallas and you dominate in camp and you know you and, and you're not gonna make the team no matter what. I I was looking forward to going to China. I'm like, fuck it. At this point, I just wanna play. I just wanna hoop. I can get some good money over there hooping. Um let me go out there and play. Um China treated me very well. I'm talking about like you're a superstar over there. If you started on any NBA, if you played on any NBA team, like you go to China, bro. They treat you like you they act like I was LeBron or something like that. Right, because Stefan Marbury was over there, basically the, the king of China yeah. when it comes to basketball. Yep, and, and Steph was telling me, like, man, you know, 
He's like, Eddie, man, well, they ain't call me, he called me City. Everybody calls me City. He's like, man, City, you could get, you could do it big over here. You could do it how I'm doing it over here. You just got to really embrace it. And I really just couldn't, man. I couldn't, I couldn't embrace being around people not talking English, like sleeping on these hard beds, practicing on these hard floors, hurting my knees and like, People smoking cigarettes everywhere you go, like in elevators, in the locker room. They're coming in there smoking cigarettes. Some of the Chinese players were smoking cigarettes. After the game, I'm like, bro, I can't I can't get used to this shit, man. Like, hell no. But, um, so I just was like, man, you know what? Let me let me let me go back home and, and try and figure it out from from there. Right. You played your last game in February of 2013. Right. And then you went back home. And uh, was it that next year that uh, your wife, Patricia Curry, joined Basketball Wives LA? Patrice, uh, yeah. She had been asking me to do it for a while, man. And I'm like, I wanted to move to LA. And she was like, you know what? If if we move to LA, you got to let me do Basketball Wives. And I'm like, all right, cool. As long as I don't have to be on it, we could, <laughs> we could, we could, we could do it. Um, I still ended up having to be on there a couple episodes. But yeah, that's she ended up joining Basketball Wives, yep. How's that overall experience? Because a lot of times when, you know, when you have couples and one or both of them join reality TV, it kind of causes problems along the way. Yeah, I think you got to be I think you got to be ready for uh, whatever the, the director wants you to do, whatever the producer wants you to do. They kind of dictate the narratives on those shows. Um, and if that's not your personality, if that's not your character, then that show is not for you. Um, they're gonna end up kicking you off. They're gonna write you off, or you're gonna just stick out like a sore thumb. And that's pretty much how it was. She just wasn't that type of lady, man. She's a, she really carries herself a different way. Um, she wasn't gonna get on there and act a fool with the girls and throw drinks on somebody or let somebody throw a drink on her or get on there and fight somebody. And it's not like they were gonna like let you fight and then and everything would be cool after that. You're gonna fight and you're probably gonna go to jail and. And you got to figure it out on your own. Like it's just like, damn, what do I, like? So it was like one of those one of those situations. Um, they wanted me on the show. I got on there a couple times. The first show I went on, I think they had me go to a. Uh, they told us it was just gonna be a regular party. They was gonna set it up like a club night or something like that for my birthday. And they ended up bringing strippers out, like a little woman stripper. Come to find <laughs> out, come to find out, she was like a porn star. Like uh, her name was Bridget the Midget. She was like a porn star, bro. I'm like, Patrice, what do you got me doing, man? Like, <laughs> I'm trying to just chill out here. You know what I'm saying? I'm in LA. I'm chilling. I, I'm out. Weed is legal out here. Just let me just relax. And it was, it was crazy, bro. It was really crazy. So I'm like, I don't want to be on the show no more. And it got to a point where they were just trying to force me to come on the show. And I just really didn't want to do it. And um, so they, you know, they, they were like, well, either you're going to be on the show. Or Patrice is gonna have to turn up and get on here and smack somebody or do something. And she didn't really want to do that. So we kind of parted ways. Got it. And was it uh 2018? You ended up going back to China again and playing? Yeah. One of my one of my good friends ended up being a GM over there and asked me to come over there. So I went over there for a little bit. Yeah, for a year? Yep. I don't it was, I don't think it was a year. It was a little. It felt like a year, man. Shit. Every day, it's like dog years over there, bro. Every day is like 15 days or something. It feels like, I don't know, man. It's crazy. Every like every 15 days feels like one day. But I don't know. However, you know what I mean? Like, that shit's, it's a drag over there, bro. It's a drag. It really is, bro. But, I mean, I really, I ain't gonna lie. The last time I went, I really kind of embraced it. I really kind of realized, like, damn, everybody don't get to see this. You know, I really, I've always been that type of person where it's like, man, I don't want to just go to Jamaica. I want to bring my family to Jamaica. I don't want to just see this shit. I don't want to just explain it to them. I don't want to send pictures. I want people to see this. So when I went to China the last time, I really was taking it in. Like, damn, I want to bring my family to China because I want them to see this. I want them to experience this culture and just the difference so they could have an appreciation for where we are and just be more, you know, just be well-versed in, in, in just the world, you know, and, and different cultures and things. Well, Eddie Curry, man, uh, a hell of a journey, uh, a hell of a journey. And uh, I mean, it just kind of shows, you know, when you say, you know, you hear songs like more money, more problems and people think, oh, that's not true. People just talking shit. It's yeah. like, no, no. I mean, the reality is, is that, you know, you could tell by, you know, what we went through, 
the more money you got, the more problems start to arise and the more bullshit you had to deal with. And, you know, you're making more, but you got to deal with more. And, you know, there's always someone there that's ready to take it from Absolutely. you by, by any means necessary. By any means necessary, bro. And, and it's crazy because everything is so largely based on like your pub, your public persona, your public people's perception of you in the public. And forever, I always kind of looked at it like, man, I'll just, the best way to get out the news is to be quiet. I always kind of mm. felt like if I, if I, if I give a rebuttal to what dude said in that article, if I come out and say something, then it just lives longer. And then it becomes my word against his. And let me just be quiet because if I wait long enough, something else crazy will happen and then everybody will forget about that. And I did that so many times over and over and over again to the point where it really didn't work out that way. People kind of developed these, you know, stigmatism, these these stereotypes about me. And yeah, man, it's 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 hard to live that stuff down. And I just kind of got to a point where I'm like, you know what, let me go ahead and and tell, you know, my truth about what's going on. That's when I ended up doing the the article with the Players Tribune. And they and it's dope because they actually gave me and my wife a a podcast now, so we do like a relationship podcast based on movies and things like that. But we really draw a lot of parallels to our life. A lot of like we talk about the um, just having kids outside the marriage and things like that, like and how we were able to get through it. And you know, it's 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 therapeutic to us because uh, a lot of it is stuff that I've never said to her. I'm hearing feelings that she had that she's never said before, and um, you know, it's really dope. And I'm just you know, I was happy to get that that type of opportunity to just heal in public. Um, and I think that that's dope. That's what it is. Eddie Curry, man, I appreciate you sharing your story. Wish you all the best. And I think you have, you know, you still have a lot of stories left. You oh, know man, it's, I mean? some, I like it's, it's some shit, started. bro. It's some shit. You got to have me on again. We'll, we'll get into it for real because I could. It's so much, bro. I ain't going to lie to you, bro. It's a lot. It's a lot, man. It's a lot. That's why when, 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 uh, when you first reached out, I'm like, man, let me talk to my wife because I knew that I had to be in a situation that she got to be ready to relive this. She got to be ready to, to hear this again. And I think with us having a podcast and us like, like reliving it together, like I kind of feel like it just kind of made sense to, it, it was okay to voice it again, I guess. Well, I appreciate you choosing our platform as Thank a place you. to actually voice it, man. Wish you all the best, man. Thanks, Until Brad. Next I appreciate time. it. Peace.